University of Hawaii, um, Stanford University, Harvard Teaching Hospital, and at Boston University Medical Center. And um, I encourage you to talk to his lovely wife over here after his presentation or during, uh, who's always supporting him and uh, promoting the, uh, all the books that you see over there and the supplements as well. So uh, help me introduce him with a round of applause, Dr. Blake. Muchísimas gracias, amiga. <laughs> I have my giant clock here, so I won't go over time, because I love to talk. I'm going to go back two slides. This is my wife, Catherine, on our sailboat sojourn. And we did the impossible thing. In 1995, we disappeared from America and went to 100 anchorages, ports, and hung out. I wrote the book Healing Medicine that we have over here during that time. Took a close look at modern medicine. In fact, at first I wanted to name the book Stupid Doctors, but my wife wouldn't let me. Um, and that would be offensive. But really, I, I get mad sometimes when people are treated in such a way that drugs are the only approach when we in this room probably know that food has a lot to do with health. And as far as perfect food goes, these people in the Amazon eat corn, yams, and peanuts principally. So that's kind of a natural food for humans. Back in America, I made my own food pyramid. But this is the food advertising pyramid. It's based on billions of dollars spent by the food companies. So we have 20% of these billions spent on fast food advertising. I won't mention any golden arches by name because that would be a brand. Uh, candy and gum, another 20%. Alcohol, another almost 20%. And then we have soft drinks as a whole category. If you get down to 8% of the money spent on snacks and nuts, well, nuts are at least good for you, so there's something. And then coffee, tea, and cocoa, well, there are some antioxidants in those. And then the USDA meat and dairy adds 8% of the advertising budget. You know, food spends more on advertising than anything except Cars, exactly. Um, the black line on the bottom, you see this little black line? That's all the healthy stuff. Fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans. So this is not what's getting subsidized. It's not what's getting advertised. And yet that's the healthy stuff that really helps us not get disease and even in some cases can cure disease. So I thought this was fun for you to see. This is uh, imperfect food um, choices here. And the topic of today's talk is perfect food. I'm going to look at the human as an animal. OK, here's a little story. A group of students found an animal out in the woods. They didn't know what it was. It was friendly. They'd never seen anything like it before. So they put it in their van, and they drove it to a professor's house, big shot professor of zoology. And they went in to talk to him, and they said, we have an animal in the car. We don't know what to feed it, but I bet it's hungry. What do we feed it? Shall we bring it in? Do you want to look at it? And he said, no. Tell me about its feet. Does it have claws? Tell me about its teeth. What do they look like? And I can tell you what to feed the animal. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to look at the different animals, the carnivores, the omnivores, the vegetarian animals. And I know the Encyclopedia Britannica says that humans are omnivores. And certainly we can eat all kinds of food, but which one's the healthiest diet? What's the healthiest food for us? We could bring a polar bear to Maui, where we live, and feed it avocados, and it would live for a certain period of time. But are avocados a natural food for polar bears? Can they really digest that? Will they get everything they need? You know, Probably not. So people live amazingly long on completely wrong food for their bodies. So my goal for you today is to find out the best food for your bodies, for perfect energy and digestion, for disease resistance, for protein satisfaction, and get just the nutrients that we need. One of my projects is the Diet Doctor. Kat, can you Vanna White the Diet Doctor for us? It's a, it's a CD. No, oh, very nice. Uh, and what you do is you plug in what you ate in a day and how much you ate of everything, and it analyzes it with 46 color graphs and shows you how much you got of each nutrient that you need and compares that to how much you need. 
And that's a very scientific way of determining if your diet is deficient in some things or excessive in others. American diets are deficient in things like vitamin E and excessive in things like saturated fat. <laughs> Which is more natural for people to eat? I mean, if you really think about primitive man running along upside down trying to suck on that cow's tit, it's just a ludicrous idea. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And if you think of a horse or some other animal trying to suck on that cow's tit, that's not likely to happen either. So the Dairy Council with the mustache and Superman and all that got milk stuff, they spend billions of dollars telling us that milk is a natural food for man. I mean, it's as American as milk and apple pie. And yet, in my opinion, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a nutritional biochemist, I'm a scientist. I do research studies. Um, I'm doing one in Hawaii now on beating dementia with nutrition, stopping it at least. <laughs> in my opinion, I think the dairy products are one of the worst foods for man. Yeah. They slow digestion, they have all the stuff in them. Uh, and natural? Hardly. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you think the natural diet of this guy is? Do you think that he's a tree climber, just looking at his body? Probably not. I don't think so. And he's a tooth cleaner here, um, taking care of that monster. Looking at those teeth, would you say he might be able to catch an animal, maybe chew it up, eat it? I think so. It's pretty easy to tell that this critter is designed for catching animals uh, from rats to deers to humans. You know, that's what he's designed for. So we we'll take a look at, um, how about this little guy? These little teeth here, they're not really designed for biting into the hide of a pig. They're just not, but they're really good at lettuce. You know, you can kind of tell what a rabbit's supposed to eat, tender greens. You know, our teeth aren't that much different from a rabbit. And um, their speed helps them get away with predators, but as far as catching anything, it's not too likely a rabbit's going to actually attack another creature and, and get them. Okay, now what about this guy? He's pretty quick. He's fast enough to catch animals. And these are dagger-like canines here. Quite different from the dagger-like canines that we have, these little tiny things. <laughs> if you thought about it, we have some wild piggies that live in our jungle with us. They come through and we welcome them. We share our fruit with them and, and uh, we just kind of coexist. But the idea of a human First of all, catching a pig, which is unlikely, and then biting into the side of the hide of a pig, it wouldn't work. Your teeth would just kind of slide off, and the pig would probably say, oh, can you bite a little higher? It itches up there. I mean, it wouldn't hurt it at all. We're, we're just, but this guy can actually grab an animal hide with his teeth. Also, there's a problem. We also have wild chickens and roosters on our land. Well, as far as biting through the feathers or the fur, I, our teeth can't quite do that. But on the other hand, this guy could actually bite through feathers or fur or fish or something like that. He also has web feet. He can swim so he can catch fish. Um, I would call a bear an omnivore. So today I'll talk about omnivores. I'll talk about vegetarian animals like a rabbit, omnivores. And then this is a uh, primate. Look at his dentition and, you know, think about your own dentition. They're very, very similar. The primates are very similar in evolution. By the way, did you know that Darwin, at looking at the evolution of species, thought that people were vegetarian animals and should eat succulent leaves and fruits and other plant matter, but not animals. And Carl Linnaeus, who so many of the species are named after, he also thinks that humans are in the category of plant eaters. So there's a couple of great minds who think that. What about this guy? You think he could climb a tree and get fruit? No problem. In fact, I'm glad we don't have monkeys in Hawaii because they'd eat all our fruit. There'd be no way to stop them. They'd be happy, very, very happy. So we have omnivores like dogs and bears. We have vegetarian animals like a zebra. We have a carnivore like this beautiful kitty here. And then we have the question. Question mark, what do you think about these teeth? And how wide can you open your mouth? 
This guy can open his mouth pretty wide, but he couldn't really bite into the side of an animal with those flat teeth, just like us. This guy can open his teeth quite wide, and him too, and they really can bite into an animal. So we're just trying to look at what's natural for us. Carnivores have dagger-like canines, and they have scissor incisors that actually slice the meat, whereas omnivores have, you see the canine's not quite as long in an omnivore as a carnivore. And here's our canine right here. See that big boy? Not too impressive. So there is the idea that humans are hunter-gatherers and our primitive ancestors were running after a buffalo and duking it out with them and eating its body. It's just not as likely as you think. And if you wanted to go out in the jungle with no technology and make an arrow and try and shoot a buffalo, good luck. Um, not that easy to make a balanced arrow with a razor-sharp tip that could actually do more than just annoy most creatures, much less hit them. So we have short, blunt canines. Our incisors are broad, flattened, and spade-shaped. Very different teeth between these. Tick another look, thin tooth enamel on carnivores. They don't run into a lot of abrasive materials. You know, they're just slicing meat. Have you ever fed a dog a piece of meat? What do they do? They just gobble, gobble, gulp. And humans really chew their food up a lot. One of the differences I'll mention is our tracheas are different, so we don't choke on things. Now, the molars have jagged edges. Whoops, sorry. Um, here you can see the jagged-edged molars of this prehistoric carnivore. Whereas our molars are quite flat. Now, the other interesting thing is that in carnivores and omnivores, the molars slice past each other. Try it. <laughs> Can't quite do it, can you? So our molars meet flat. They do not slice. So that some of the differences, if we really were designed to eat meat, then our molars would slice past each other like all the other animals that are. And this is a mouth opening shot. This little girl singing her heart out at a football game, and that's about as big as her mouth is going to open. Our jaws are just not designed to get that big. But look at this wolf mouth here, or this mountain lion. They can really open their mouths wide and get a grip on the side of an animal. And the uh, donkey here also has kind of a limited ability to grab an animal with his mouth. So. Uh, the swallowing thing is, well, for one thing, there's a side-to-side -side chewing action. We can move our, now try move your molars back and forth. We can chew on one side and the other. We can move our jaws back and forth, but dogs and bears can't. Cats can't. Their jaw just closes and opens. It doesn't go side to side. So that's a difference between carnivores, omnivores, and vegetarian animals. And the trachea is very different. You know, when people choke, it's almost always on meat. There's a lot of choking deaths in America. It's almost always on meat because our trachea has rings around it that are made of cartilage that limit the stretchiness so things get stuck in it. But not so cats and dogs. They don't have any cartilage in their trachea and they can actually chomp down huge chunks of things and not choke. I'm sure you've seen this if you've ever seen a dog eat something really large. <laughs> It's an interesting shot. They had a choice. They could save this guy or take this picture. And they decided the picture was better, you know, just forget about him. <laughs> Carnivore lips are really thin and the tongue isn't muscular. You, you know, a dog or a cat tongue, it's a, like a thin piece of ham kind of looking. Where our tongues are really made to move things around in our mouth. Very different. And our lips are different, too. We can, uh, for instance, for eating fruit, our lips are very mobile to help us get the right parts of the fruit and spit out the parts we don't want, the seeds and things. Dogs and cats can't do that as well. And our, the whole thing, the, the jaw, the structure of the jaw, in the carnivores, they have tremendous pressure, crushing pressure. Anyone ever been bitten by a dog in the room? Yeah, tremendous crushing pressure. Every, you know, you've been bit by kids, too, and that hurts, too. But the dog has much more power. So just kind of for a minute, looking at the mouth, what do you think? Would you vote for humans carnivore, omnivore, or vegetarian? Okay, we're going for vegetarian here. Now, how fast really are we? I mean, 
we want to think that the human species is the fastest, toughest, baddest thing on the planet. <laughs> but the cheetah can do 62 miles per hour in a burst mode to catch an animal. And about the best even these fantastic athletes can do is 24 miles per hour. Even a bear can do better than that. And a rabbit runs 35 to 45 miles an hour. So as kids, we all tried to catch animals. I remember running along the beach trying to catch the seagulls. I grew up in San Francisco. And, you know, I never caught one. Well, they can fly. Okay, that's not fair. But they're also much faster than we are. And I remember in, in Maui, we had a farmer with cows, and one would get out of the fence, and we tried to get him back in. We couldn't catch the cow. We just aren't that fast. Sorry about that. I know we want to think of ourselves as, you know, really mighty. Oops, it was a double. Now, what about tracking prey? I hear stories of people in Africa who can run down a deer, and I don't know what they do then. Um, I guess hack it into pieces and then carry hundreds of pounds back to the village 20, 30 miles back. I, I'm not sure what they're doing with the deer once they catch it. But what if the deer goes into a thicket and comes out another end? How are they going to know where the deer went? This guy has no problem with that. He can smell 100,000 times better than we can, and he can sniff while he runs. Now, do we have a volunteer in the crowd who'd like to run back and forth while sniffing the ground? Anybody <laughs> want to try that? Uh, it's really awkward for people to smell and run at the same time. In fact, humans are not very good at tracking. I mean, we have the, you know, the great Indian trackers and, and things, and they can see the footprints and things. But really, the smelling is the way to go. So, yeah, humans just aren't really great at running things down and tracking. I mean, that's a part of being a hunter. You'd have to, you'd have to track it. How camouflaged are we? Anyone see an animal in this picture? You can just make them out, huh? Beautiful camouflage. This is a sleepy leopard hanging on a branch. Really beautiful looking cat. Humans don't have camouflage because vegetables don't have eyes. <laughs> Fruit doesn't have eyes. Nuts and seeds and beans don't have eyes. So we are not camouflaged. Uh, it might be kind of nice if we were from a, you know, not getting eaten by predator standpoint, but we're not. And I talked about tracking prey. This little kitty has ears that can swivel like little sonar things, and she can track inside a bush the movements of a mouse. Okay, anybody want to show me ear swiveling techniques? That's also very difficult to do. I mean, you can wiggle them a little bit, but as far as radar dishing them, it doesn't really work too well. And of course, the hearing on animals is much more acute on the carnivores. You can really pick up things. When my cat's ears prick up, I know something's happening somewhere in the yard, but I often can't hear it. So I just ask him. <laughs> now, there's something called frontal armoring. This is a Hawaiian surfer boy, and while very cute, he does not have much frontal armoring like the tiger above him. Now, imagine that the Hawaiian surfer boy decided and was actually fast enough, somehow tricked a rooster into grabbing that rooster. What would happen? The rooster would use its spurs and its beak and would tear him up. What about the tiger? Well, he's got fur. That's frontal armoring. So he can do that. You know, same with any other animal you can think of. Humans are just too fragilely skinned to be going grabbing animals. So I'm talking about what we're designed for without technology. I mean, if you give a human a 40 6 rifle and sit him in a duck blind in a tree, he might be able to actually catch a deer. We wouldn't be able to chew on it, you know, without a knife, but he could at least shoot it. But without that technology, what are we designed for? I mean, the cats don't need technology. Digestion is very, very different also between animals. You know, I wish that in school we all learned about digestion. Uh, it's something that I, I think we should really know more about. There's a short digestive tract in carnivores, like 12 feet for the cat the size of a human. Omnivores also have a short digestive tract, but this is our digestive tract. It's about 30 feet in length. We can extract all of the carbohydrates from food during a period of almost 24 hours of digestion, but it's not really designed for meat. Our liver is small because, I mean, our liver is huge, 
but the liver of carnivorous animals is very small because plants have the toxins. You know, herbally speaking, we use some of those toxins for medicine, but plants all have toxins, so animals that eat plants have much larger livers to detoxify the toxins, whereas carnivores have small. Humans have a huge liver. Oh, I mentioned the wide, stretchy esophagus, but the stomach capacity makes up 65% of digestive capacity, which means that if you were a cat living out in the jungle, you wouldn't have an opportunity to eat every two hours like humans generally do, right? You'd need to find and catch something and then eat it, and then you might not find something else for a day or two or three. So your stomach is able to take this huge hunk of food and slowly digest it down so that you can find... Now, humans don't have that. You know how much you can eat. You know, it's, it's about this much, and more than that, then you start getting too full. So that's another difference between us. Uh, <laughs> the wait staff at Luigi's like to have fun when they administered the Heimlich maneuver. Um, Luigi's obviously is serving meat, because if they were serving fruit or vegetables, probably there wouldn't be people choking on it all the time. Whoop. So one more difference in digestion is, well, I don't mention it here, but uh, an 80-pound meal is what an uh, animal like a carnivore could eat. I don't think anybody, even the hot dog champion eaters or pie champion eaters, can eat 80 pounds of food in one sitting. But that's, that's because humans are really designed to browse all day on food. Have you noticed that? Like kids just like to eat all the time. And um, any vegans in the audience who like to eat all the time? Yeah, kind of works that way, doesn't it? Without a giant chunk of greasy meat in your stomach to keep you from eating for four hours, um, you, you kind of get hungry a little bit over time, a little bit and a little bit more. Oh, this is Healthy Recipes for Friends, my wife's cookbook. I tested all the recipes. And this has food for humans in it, especially your creamy walnut dressing. That's my favorite. Well, here's something interesting. I wrote a book, a college textbook for McGraw-Hill on vitamins and minerals. And when I was looking at beta-carotene, I see that humans have an enzyme that can snip beta-carotene in half and create retinol, which is a form of vitamin A. But guess what? The carnivores and omnivores can't do that because they're designed to get vitamin A from the animals they eat. Humans are designed to get vitamin A from the fruits and vegetables we eat with carotenes, like alpha and beta carotene. Those are our sources where we get that. So that's another clue that we're supposed to eat those. In fact, most people in the world get most of their vitamin A from plant sources, you know, despite eating other things that has preformed vitamin A. Also, preformed vitamin A is potentially toxic. For elders, and I just made the grade and turned 65, 5,000 I use the max per day of preformed vitamin A. There's no limit to carotenoids. They're just great antioxidants and really good for you. Now, another difference is that vitamin C is synthesized in just about every animal in the world except humans and guinea pigs and one fish and one bird. I mean, almost universal. There are four enzymes to make glucose, blood sugar, into vitamin C, ascorbate. And humans only have three of them. We lost the last enzyme somewhere in probably equatorial Africa during our evolution because we ate fruits and vegetables every day and we didn't need to get... To, to make our own vitamin C. Now that's kind of interesting because that leads you to wonder how much vitamin C do these other animals make? I mean, the machinery of the body doesn't waste time making things we don't need. So dogs and cats make about the least amount of vitamin C adjusted to 150 pounds, which is 2,000 milligrams a day. And mice and rats make about the most vitamin C, which is 20,000 milligrams per day, again adjusted to 150 pounds. So how much do you think we need? Well, let me ask you this. When's the last time your dog had a cold? <laughs> so adequate vitamin C is really important. Now, I analyze diets with my Diet Doctor software, and the most I can find with the best diet, even a raw food vegan diet, the most vitamin C I've ever seen is about 400 milligrams. But we might need, like other primates, get about 1,200 because they're eating wild foods that are richer in vitamin C. 
So we might need actually more than the 400 we're getting for optimal health, which is why in, uh, I do, in my clinical trial, I have a changes in food to prevent Alzheimer's disease, and I also have a supplement called brain and body food. And Kat, you want a Vanna White brain and body food? This supplement contains most of the stuff we're using in our trial, and it has 1,200 milligrams of ascorbated vitamin C. It's ascorbated, so it's non-acidic and rapidly absorbed and doesn't cause digestive disturbances like the ascorbic acid kind does. So if you are going to take supplemental, make sure it's ascorbate and good luck finding it. I had to have these vitamins made special to get the right things in them. Stomach acid varies too. You know, a lot of people tell me, well, in the ancient days, humans would just go and they would pick up dead animals and eat them that other things had killed. Hello, botulism. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of terrible diseases people get and die because we don't have the stomach acid to detoxify those bacteria. But the carnivores have stomach acid like battery acid, whereas humans have stomach acid kind of like tomatoes. We're, our acidity is just not enough so that we can eat a dead animal. In fact, milk has to be sterilized before we can eat it. If it isn't, there can be problems with bacteria, and meat certainly is sterilized, and we all know you have to cook chicken and fish and meat or you're going to die. So humans really aren't designed that way either to eat meat. Saliva is different too. We make alpha amylase ptalin, otherwise known as spit for the short word. Um, but our saliva is able to predigest starches. This is, of course, not true of the carnivores and omnivores because starches aren't a big part of their diet. There's a difference in colons. Now, humans have a huge problem with colorectal cancer and hemorrhoids and all kinds of digestive upsets, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease. A lot of these digestive upsets are due to eating things that are not designed for our stomachs. And if you want to know what an animal's stomach and colon looks like that's designed to eat meat, it looks like this. There's no sacculation. That's these little sac-like protrusions on a human colon. is convoluted, and this is just one example. They actually are all different shapes. But the carnivore's colon is straight and not sacculated. They're not designed to ferment the indigestible fibers and get more nutrition out of them, but we are. But that causes a problem when the meat goes in and ferments. It makes scatols and ammonia and all kinds of unsavory chemicals that basically kind of slowly poison people over the years who do eat meat and dairy products and fish even. Well, then there's a little problem of, now this guy with his Freddy Krueger hands might be able to do something with it, but you can see that this kitty has retractable claws, razor sharp conical retractable claws. What about ours? Can anyone want to demonstrate retraction and it, you can't do it. They don't go in and out. They just, yeah. <laughs> okay, they work on husbands. She's demonstrating there. But as far as catching prey, not too good at that. Uh, our nails are fragile. They just break off. But have you ever had a cat scratch you? Those are tough nails. They're designed for catching and butchering prey. Now, what about nutrition? What are we designed to do, nutritionally speaking? Well, with meat in the diet, I analyzed it, and this shows the amount of protein here. We should have this much protein, but with the meat in the diet, we're getting this much. So we need about 50 grams, and with meat in the diet, we're often getting 150 grams of protein. Now, everybody talks about where do you get your protein? Do you get enough protein? Everybody gets enough protein. In fact, everybody gets too much protein. I'm a strict vegan, and I get 83 grams a day on average. I need 46. Okay, everybody in this room needs something like 46 to 56 grams a day. And I'll bet everyone in this room, unless you're not getting enough calories to live, is getting much more than that. No matter what you eat. The only way you could possibly get less is if you ate only bananas and nothing else all day. Or maybe only watermelon and nothing else all day. But I can't find anyone who will actually do that. So I can't record a diet record of that. Because anybody who eats, you know... Six or eight bananas is going to want to put peanut butter on the next one, and darn, you got enough protein. <laughs> Pretty healthy snack there, too. Um, and we look at this one, a uh, little fuzzy here. Let me see. 
Not sure what that is. Um, but fiber's up here. And fiber on a plant-based diet is nice and high, and protein's about what you need. Oh, this is cholesterol over here. Of course, cholesterol isn't happening on a plant-based diet, but when you eat meat or eggs or fish or chicken or any of those things, you get a lot of cholesterol. You know, there's a fair amount of cholesterol in fish, too. Something nobody seems to notice. And excess fat really doesn't cause heart disease in carnivores, but it causes a number one killer heart disease in Americans and all over the world. Heart disease, number one killer. Strokes, number two. Also related to excess saturated fat, animal fat in the diet. This is how I analyze diets. I use my own diet doctor software based on the USDA food composition database. So I input what somebody ate in a day, or I do things like put in a diet, like a standard American diet or a paleo diet, and then I see how they all rate the different dietary things. And it's easy to lose weight, but it's hard to design a diet that's perfect in nutrition. Here's a comparison. Now, in this diet, there was chicken and a burger with 133 grams of protein, and most of it came from the chicken and the burger. These two bars are the chicken and the burger. Now, here's 74 grams of protein, typical in a whole food. Whole bread and beans were contributing most of the protein, but you see it's distributed all the way up and down. So when someone says, where do you get your protein? You get it, as a vegan, from many different sources. All of your food contributes a little bit to it. The fruits, not so much, or vegetables, the nuts and seeds a lot, the beans a tremendous amount, and the grains also provide protein too. So it's more distributed in a vegan. Now, amino acids, people have talked about protein quality. Protein's made up of amino acids, and adults need eight amino acids. Well, I wondered, of course, is the vegetable protein going to be complete in the amino acids? You know, I kind of quit looking at these graphs after 30 years of analyzing diets because I, again, have found no one with an amino acid spectrum that was not perfect. So here we have the, um, the ideal amino acid spectrum with tuna and beef. And here we have the actual amino acid spectrum with tuna and beef. You know, some things are a little higher that are supposed to be higher. And here we have potatoes and nuts as predominant protein. And again, some things are higher that are supposed to be higher. The spectrum is fine. So you don't really need to worry too much about getting enough protein or high enough quality protein. I guess the third thing would be absorption of protein. But it's 75 to 95 percent absorbed protein from all sources. It's not strictly based on, you know, animal proteins absorb better than plant protein. Kat? As far as perfect food, we play around with the software a lot, I do too. And we found beans are almost identical to our ideal protein source. Really? Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because we don't even know what Yeah, but you have to eat, what, about four watermelons a day to get enough calories. So I, I, what I did is I put a one food button in my software. So you push the one food button and pick it. Like if you pick green beans in your one food, the program automatically, I programmed it to say, okay, I'll, I'll put in 2,200 calories of green beans, whatever you pick. So then you look at that, and it's beautiful. It matches the human requirement perfectly except for extra protein. Luckily, plant protein doesn't seem to contribute to cancer the way animal protein does. And that's a real advantage. Comparing vitamin A, 3,000 3, IUs of vitamin A in the non-antioxidant toxic form in a diet that's meat-based. And look at this, 17,000 IUs of vitamin A from antioxidant carotenoids in a vegan diet. And um, I think that's chard. This, this bar is Swiss chard. It has a huge amount of antioxidant carotenoids in it. We all know Swiss chard is an excellent food. It's very high in oxalic acid, so I would not recommend putting it in smoothies or eating it raw. This one you kind of got to cook a little bit to break down the oxalic acid, or you really feel it in your throat as it kind of burns and bites. This is my book. Uh, McGraw-Hill College textbook on vitamins and minerals. I don't have them with me, but you can order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's under 20 bucks, which I thought was really cool for McGraw-Hill to make a textbook under 20 bucks. Hey, do you have a PDF download of vitamins and minerals 
No, I'm not allowed to do that, unfortunately. There's a copyright issue with doing that. I do have downloads of my other books on my website, which is drsteveblake.com. It's drsteveblake.com. What about vitamin C? Well, on an American diet, only 24 milligrams. I mean, the minimum is 75 to 90. But on this one, 355 milligrams of vitamin C on a vegan whole food diet. And so you can get a lot. Whether even that is enough to maximize protection from all of the diseases that plague humans, I think maybe a little more would even be better, but certainly not in the ascorbic acid form, and more than 99% of the supplements are the ascorbic acid form, so I, I normally don't recommend supplements that contain that at all. Now, this is the brain and body food that I have ascorbated vitamin C, and it's probably a good idea to boost it. Um, I have it made in a lab so I can control it. I made a supplement for Rainbow Light called Advanced Nutrition System, and it had the really good vitamin C and the really good vitamin E, and they changed it over time to the point where I wouldn't even take it anymore. Now, here's an American diet. Do you know how many Americans get an, the bare minimum of vitamin E in their diet? 7%. It was 8% last year. It went down. So 93% of Americans are struggling along without enough vitamin E. That means the LDL is not protected for heart disease and strokes. That means that the brain is not protected against Alzheimer's disease. We're deficient in that. It looks like we may have a question in the back. You'll have to say it very loudly, please. Okay, the best form for vitamin E. I wonder if that's the next slide. No, it's not. Um, the best form for vitamin E, um, my favorite vitamin E pills look a lot like walnuts. And they have the, the gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E. In our clinical trial, we're having people eat one ounce of walnuts. We're having them powdered because a lot of elders who have trouble digesting things. And one ounce of sunflower seeds for alpha tocopherol. We're also giving them gamma tocopherol in a supplement, you know, the brain and body food style. So that's the best form. What if you went out to buy a supplement of vitamin E? Again, chances are 99% that it would be the synthetic alpha tocopherol, which has been found to increase mortality 4.6%. Not what we want. And I could really go into why that's so bad, but... Uh, it's not really vitamin E, okay? Vitamin E is a family of tocopherols and tocotrienols, and this is just one of the four tocopherols, but it's synthetically made so that there are eight different isomers or chemical structures, and only one of them is the real alpha tocopherol. The other seven are fake alpha tocopherol that don't work. So when your brain implants vitamin E on a brain cell to protect that brain cell from death, and it's a fake vitamin E, it doesn't work. So I, it's almost better not to take it than to take that synthetic fake form of vitamin E. In the, in the rainbow light vitamin I made, the administration got really mad at me because the vitamin E costs as much as everything else in the multiple vitamin combined. Because the real stuff costs more. Whereas synthetic E is cheap. Well, they switch to synthetic E to save money. But at least I have control over brain and body food and I, it's not going to switch because I, I tell them what to do. Now, saturated fat, oh, vitamin E, nuts and seeds, avocados, it's found in the fatty parts of plants. It's also found in vegetable oils, but for many reasons, I don't recommend vegetable oils as a source of vitamin E. Because when you think about it, they take a bean or a nut or a seed or a grain, and they basically take everything out but the oil and give you just empty calorie oil without all the good stuff. It's just not in there anymore. Well, here we're comparing saturated fat. In a typical American diet, it's about 15%. With well, the American Heart Association, it has been 7% of calories and no more, the saturated fat limit. They're now talking about 5 or 6% of calories. Guess what? 5 or 6% of calories, you cannot do it and eat any animal products because you go over. I, I mean, I get about 4% of my calories from saturated fats as a strict vegan. So the, the American Heart Association is basically saying, 
to keep your sat fats below the death level, you can't eat animal products, which is pretty much the case. In, um, yeah, about 3.8%, that's typical for me. And um, for 15%, now the Atkins diet, I think, went up to about 28% saturated fat. And there's even a few diets that, that are higher than that. They're kind of usually called the heart attack diets. <laughs> oh, it's not funny, especially since Dr. Atkins himself died of a heart attack. This is a book on heart attacks. That's my latest book, and we have just a couple copies on the table. If you wanted to avoid a heart attack, there's a lot of uh, all research-based information in that book. And all of the information in all of my books and lectures is based upon scientific peer-reviewed studies in reputable journals. And I very carefully read the full studies, make sure they're not sponsored or slanted, that the authors know what they're talking about before I'm, I'm going to quote them. This is a little graph I made of a heart attack. Uh, if you were to eat 15%, like a typical American, of your calories as saturated fat, that's animal fat. Coconut oil is about the only source of saturated fat um, that people sometimes eat. And chocolate has some saturated fat, but if you don't eat more than an ounce or two, it, it doesn't contribute much. If you ate 15% of animal fat, your LDL would likely be 160 or above, very much the danger level. Your total cholesterol above 220. Now, 220 is the average American cholesterol. And people come to me, I say, how's your cholesterol? I say, it's fine. My doctor says it's fine. And what is it? It's 220. That means a heart attack every 32 seconds. That's average for Americas. So I don't think average American cholesterol is really a great idea. That's the very dangerous place to be. Now, if you get your saturated fat down to 10% of calories, that's like a Mediterranean diet. It's better. That's why people say it's a better diet. It certainly is. Your LDL might get down to 100 and your total cholesterol down to 200. Is it possible to have a heart attack? Absolutely. But is it less likely than on an American diet? Yes, it's less likely. Over time, if you switch from an American diet, the clogging of the artery might become a little opened up or at least about the same, not get worse. That's about what the Mediterranean diet does. It keeps it about the same. Well, you could do a little bit better. You could go down to 7% of your calories, knock your LDL under 100, your total cholesterol under 180, so your doctor is finally going to be saying, no, you don't need statins. But you're the most profitable and most prescribed drug in the world. And your arteries would start to open up, actually start to melt. This cholesterol melts at 300 degrees. But somehow, the body's able to melt the plaque off the inside of the arteries, tiny bits by tiny bits, not forming stroke-like plaques or anything, but just melt it off. But even better, get down to a vegan diet with a low fat. Now, nuts and seeds, yes, avocados, olives, yes, but not oils and not animal fats. And then you're getting down to where the artery is opening up. Over a period of a couple of years, you can go from this to this, and Dr. Esselstyn's book, Preventing and Reversing Heart Disease, has actual images of arteries opening up from very constricted to open again in two years. No drugs, no exercise or meditation, just dietary changes. And they use a very low-fat diet for that during that period of change. Whoops, sorry. This book, Understanding Fats and Oils, A Scientific Guide to Their Health Effects, I don't carry it around because it's a book about fats, and it's a fat book, and it's about that fat. It's too heavy to lug around. But it's on my website. And dietary fats are crucially important. So in this book, I talk about processing oils, trans fats, saturated fats. If you want to know all about fats and oils, under 10 bucks on my website, you can download a PDF and use it for reference. I mean, I'd love it if you'd read through the whole thing. It talks about changing the plant-based omega-3 into EPA to combat inflammation. And also, the last chapter is a challenge for you to read, The Labyrinth of the Eicosanoids. Fascinating stuff. These tissue hormones that are so powerful in our body that they can open up our arteries, make our blood less sludgy, and relieve pain and inflammation. Yes? Did you say something about um, coconut oil? Oh, I was afraid somebody would mention coconut oil. Um, if you study this book and the chapter on saturated fats, you'll see that there's only about 10 common saturated fats. And they're all the same chemically and structurally except for the length of the carbon chain. 
So the ends are the same, just the length of the chain. There are three of them that clog the arteries and cause heart attacks and strokes. Lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid, 12, 14, and 16 long. So if we look at the composition of coconut oil, it's 40% lauric and 25% palmitic and myristic acid. For a total of 65% of its oils are artery clogging and death-inducing by heart attacks and strokes. Now, I know it's very popular right now, but for our safety, I would like us to seriously consider if we want to eat double the saturated fat as lard or butter would have. Now, I personally would not. Now, in this book, you'll also learn there are fat-soluble nutrients like vitamin E that are very important. Unfortunately, coconut does not have vitamin E. It has none at all. It doesn't need it. The husk and the shell protect it from oxidation, so its babies do fine without vitamin E, but we need it. So something like sunflower seeds have lots of it. Also, there's phytosterols. Phytosterols are able to block the cholesterol receptors in our intestine so that the cholesterol that we eat doesn't get absorbed and the cholesterol that we recirculate every day, about 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol is recirculated every day through our gall bile into our intestine, and it's not reabsorbed if you have enough phytosterols. They're found in nuts and seeds, but not coconut. And then we look at antioxidants. Many antioxidants, say in olives, have some great polyphenols, but not coconut. Now, one study that's quoted to show that coconuts have antioxidant power, oh boy, this, is, this went in my bad science folder. They took gallons of coconut oil and extracted the antioxidants, put them all into one little pill and gave it to rats, and it was antioxidant. Okay, but you, you, it doesn't work. It's not realistic at all. In the back? Got it. Can you, can you have high cholesterol as a vegan? Absolutely. And the real key with that is calories. You really need to get the calorie intake to match the amount that you need. Unfortunately, as we age, and this is more so with women than men, we become more efficient, which means that the joy of eating three meals a day means that you're going to gain weight instead of lose weight. So well, my wife has a, a technique where she'll... Instead of eating dinner, she'll have a juice. Now, one of the problems with that is, you know, vegans often don't get enough calcium. On average, vegans get about 700 milligrams a day, and we need at least 800 and probably 1,000 to 1,200 to keep our bones strong, keep away osteoporosis. So that's another reason why I put 500 milligrams of calcium in the brain and body food so that when we take it, we don't have to always eat so much. And it really, it's healthy not to eat so much. When, a lot of times I go running in the late afternoon and I don't want to eat a heavy meal. But I know I'll be calcium deficient if I don't, but then so I take the vitamins, so that's the best of both worlds. The way to beat the cholesterol thing is two things. One, eat less food or less calorie-rich foods. So that means a lot more fruits and vegetables. Beans are fine, limited amount of nuts and seeds, and watch out for any oils. Number two, more workout. You've got to get that body moving. And, and once you're eating a vegan diet and working out, you're going to see those pounds fall away. But it's not easy. It's not quick. And please start your exercise programs gradually and not all of a sudden as, you know, it could be dangerous too. Yes. Some people have a little more cholesterol than others. I know that under 150 is the heart attack proof zone. And I was kind of disappointed that I couldn't get, you know, three years ago I was at 174 and kind of stalled out. I couldn't get it down. I mean, that's still better than 99% of Americans, but I wanted to get it lower. So then I started a running program three years ago, and now it's down in the 150s. But it's still not below 150. So maybe that's the best you can do, because you're doing everything right. And that's so that's that's pretty good though. Still, yes. If you're not going to use green coffee bean, but you're going to use organic aerated, um, organic shaped brown coffee, can you have like four cups a day, or is that too much acidic? If you have a completely alkaline diet. 
Four cups of coffee a day. Okay, uh, how, how many people think that that's healthy? Raise your hand. Okay, we have uh, three coffee drinkers here. How many people think it's too much? Oh boy, looks like uh, I'm going to have to agree with the majority. I think four cups might be a bit much. I, I can't say for sure, but maybe four cups might be pushing it a little bit. How much coconut? You don't believe in coconut oil. What about, what about the whole coconut? Like coconut water is very, very healthy. And coconut meat, we grow coconuts, and because my saturated fat is so low, I can afford to eat a little coconut meat from time to time without pushing my saturated fats up. The answer is, analyze your diet for saturated fat, keep your saturated fats below 7, preferably below 6% of calories, which you can only do if you use an analysis tool, otherwise you're guessing. And then if you can do that and eat a little coconut, fine. But for most folks, they cannot possibly fit in much coconut meat. Um, you know, or milk, too. I'm going to see how many slides I have left here so I don't go over time. Um, fiber, of course, is deficient in American diets. If you look at a meat-eating diet, 20 grams, it's just not enough. And in a vegan diet, 77 grams of fiber, excellent. The best types of fiber is the gums, mucilage, and pectins that are found in fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans. These are the best fiber to keep your digestion perfect. Perfect food, really. And here we're looking at antioxidants. The antioxidants, vitamin A and as carotenoids, vitamin C, really high compared to what you need. Vitamin E is good. But on an American diet, the vitamin A and the vitamin E are very low. This one made it on vitamin C because he drank grapefruit juice, and that was his only source of vitamin E almost in the whole day. Well, this... Uh, this image here was drawn by my lovely wife, who's very talented. I had to actually pay her for this because it's on the front cover of my book, Healing Medicine. And this is a waterfall that's about a 10-minute walk from our house. And I'll tell you, I miss it a little bit right now. Nice to get in that cool water. Well, we have time for some questions, but first I want to thank you all for being patient, for listening. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay, uh, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, since we were talking about cholesterol and veganism, what's the impact of an earlier gallbladder removal for someone who has higher cholesterol than vegan? The impact of a gallbladder removal, well, it depends how it's done, but you can still get bile to go through the, the gall ducts, but it doesn't accumulate in the gallbladder. I'm not sure how that would affect cholesterol. I'm sorry, I can't actually answer that. It might affect the liver if it backs up, but chances are that, see, normally the gallbladder accumulates the bile and then it gets triggered to release it when you eat fatty foods to digest them. But without a gallbladder, it's released all the time. So it's, it's better not to eat the fatty foods that lead to the gallbladder removal in the first place. Did you have a question? Will 45 grams of fiber? Well, that's more than, more than enough. Um, sure, 45 grams would be okay. Um, if you don't eat that much, you know, then if you have less calories, like, you know, a lot of people only need 1,500 calories. Like 12, calories yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Did you have a question, young lady? Do I? Mm -hmm. Yes. Your supplements, are they food-based or chemical-based? Well, they're food-based, which is why you need actually to take two after every meal. And it makes them bulkier. So I made them small, but lots of them. Yeah. And, and so I made them food-based. For instance, the, instead of folic acid, the synthetic form, I use folate, the food form, the form in our oh, bodies. That's great. In fact, I use the active enzyme form. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and the, same with all the rest. I won't belabor all of them. Uh, question over here. How much should we be taking vitamins? Pardon me? Well, how often should we take vitamins? It really depends on the vitamins. If they have synthetic vitamin E, which almost all of them do, I would say never. If they have ascorbic acid instead of ascorbates, I would say never. So it really varies on if they're any good or not. And I'm sorry to say, but my wife will testify to this. If we run out of vitamins on the road, she'll take me to a health food store, and I will go down the line of multivitamins and feel like throwing them all on the floor. 
It's so hard. And, you know, same with Costco or a drugstore. They're just, they're another corporation making money. Like, I hate to say, you know, I shouldn't say Centrum Silver because that's a brand name, but that kind of a vitamin, it's really made to make money rather than to make health. So it's a tough question. Uh, yes? Psyllium Pardon me? Oh, psyllium seed husks are nice fiber, but I'd almost prefer you get your fiber from whole, intact fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts and seeds. If you don't get enough, you could add psyllium. I prefer the whole psyllium seed to just the husks. I think it's gentler and more soothing to the stomach. Okay, uh, just time for a couple more questions in the back here. We're not designed to store protein in our bodies. We can store carbohydrates, we can store fats, but proteins, we're not designed to do it. So it breaks down into ammonia, it breaks down into skatols and other, that in my books I describe all the things it breaks down to. So better to get a reasonable amount, unless you're a super athlete, and that takes care of itself because when you work out really hard, you eat more and you get more protein. Um, well, there's cat. Um, well, I'll mention briefly, we have some books over here. I've got one on heart disease. I've got a book on preventing Alzheimer's disease and stopping the progression with nutrition. That's a clinical trial, and that's described over here. My wife has a companion cookbook to that. Uh, let's see, we also have a book on arthritis, and I've got a really nice program to help with inflammation and pain in the joints very natural ways to do it. Instead of hiding the pain with drugs while the joints continue to degenerate, I've got ways to actually help the, preserve the cartilage we have, more synovial fluid and so on to help them go better. Um, and we have Healthy Recipes for Friends, my favorite book, um, Home of the Creamy Walnut Dressing, which if you put on any vegetable, it will be gone, I guarantee you. Um, and we have Healing Medicine, the one my wife drew the cover. I just put the insides in that, she did the cover. And that one is how modern medicine could be made better to really heal us and to heal our medical system. Uh, so far, I haven't gotten that call from Obama to redesign Obamacare yet, but I'm, I'm waiting for that. Oh, and then I have the diet doctor, which analyzes your nutrition and uh, some other stuff. So I think that it's just exactly 4.30, and although I would love to take more questions, I'll have to do it in person over at the book table. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.